Good morning. It's good to be here and to be with you. I'm David Sanders, and I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Clemson's Worship Associate Team. Each week, the community comes together to participate in worship, music, and reflection. This is where we seek to have our hearts opened and our imaginations fired. This is the place that reminds us that we are deeply connected to one another and to all living things. Even though our building is closed, we gather together for online worship. At 11.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings, we also gather for social connection time and sharing of joys and concerns in our Zoom meeting. Please join us if you will. If you're joining us for the first time this morning, welcome. This fellowship is a religious community grounded in the heritage and principles of Unitarian Universalism. We seek to create loving community, inspire joy and spiritual growth, and support courageous action. All are welcome, regardless of religious background, political persuasion, ethnicity, age, ability, sexual orientation, or gender identity or expression. If you have a desire to explore questions of truth and meaning and are respectful of our diversity of people and beliefs, you've found kindred spirits here. If you'd like more information about the fe this fellowship or Unitarian Universalism, please see information about us on our website, uufc.org. If you're interested in getting our weekly newsletter, so you can get connected to our community for online social events or weekly sharing of joys and concerns and our collective effort to support local social justice work, please reach out to the office by email on the website. And now for this week's announcements. Enrollment is now open for a new covenant group co-led by Reverend Christina Branham Martin and Kathy Crane, which will specifically focus on dismantling white supremacy and decentering whiteness. The group will utilize targeted and intentional spiritual exercises to help participants deepen their individual efforts to decenter whiteness and engage in deep conversation about the process. The group will meet by Zoom on the fourth Monday of the month, beginning in February 22nd, and it'll continue for six months. More details can be found in the Weekly Connection newsletter with links for signing up as well. Valentine's Day weekend, we will have a bake sale, a UUFC fundraiser with heart. Valentine's Day and Valentine's weekend is a day or days of heart-filled celebration. Yes, we're still figuring out the details. Have you already rustled through your recipes and memories of treats that you can bake and sell to our community? Our Valentines have a range of taste needs, gluten, dairy, nut, and or sugar-free. And remember those that who can, those who can eat the good old Valentine pastries in their old fashioned form. Yes, this is a fundraiser with an open welcoming heart. Contact Kathy Crane for more information. There's also more information listed in the Weekly Connection newsletter. The monthly meal for our daily rest uh, that's sponsored by UUFC will be on Tuesday, January 26th. Our daily rest is the Seneca Homeless Shelter. If you're able to prepare, deliver food, or assist in any other way, please contact Our Daily Rest at UUFC.org. Our Daily Rest at UUFC.org. There's also information in the Weekly Connection regarding preparing to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, there's a lot of information in there prepared by South Carolina DHAC. 
that I encourage you to go and read. It's very helpful information. Speaking of helpful, if you need technical help or if you have uh, technical skills that you would like to offer help to others, let Becky know at admin at uufc.org and she will help connect those in need of technical help with those who can offer it. And I'll remind you of our monthly benevolence. Every month we support uh, different benevolence or our uh, charity in the area. And our benevolence for January is the Clemson Child Development Center. The Clemson Child Development Center was uh, organized and founded by members of UUFC back in the 1960s. And it has persisted and is a wonderful organization since we don't take up a collection plate in this virtual world, I would encourage you to go online and to donate to our benevolence uh, through our online donation uh, button. Let us begin our worship with these opening words. Ignite us in radical love, adapted from words by Reverend Rebecca Savage. We join together today as a beloved people united in love and thirsting for restorative justice. When our chalice is lit, may it melt away the tethers that uphold whiteness in our midst. May it spark in us a spirit of humility. May it ignite in us Radical love that transforms our energy into purposeful action. Our chalice is a vessel of audacious hope. Our chalice shines a light on our shared past, signaling our intention to listen deeply, reflect wisely, and move boldly toward our highest ideals. Thank you, Dave, for those warm words of welcome and the stirring opening words. My name is Reverend Christina Branham Martin, and I'm the interim minister here at the fellowship. It is so good to be with you. We join together now as we light our chalices, both in your homes and here where I join you. and it's not wanting to light. Here it is. May we share in our words of affirmation spoken by this fellowship every week. We gather together in a spirit of love with justice as our guide. This is our chosen covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth with freedom, and to care for one another. I also light these candles of joys and concerns. The first candle I light is for the worries of the rising cases of COVID-19 and the day of the highest numbers of death in the U.S. this past Tuesday. We grieve all those who we have lost that we loved throughout this pandemic. And we grieve for the days when the virus doesn't dominate our concerns. I also light a candle for those in our community who are dealing with long-term illnesses such as chronic pain, pain uh, arthritis, and depression. We carry you in our hearts. And two candles are lit for joys. We light a candle of joy that the COVID-19 vaccine is beginning to be administered and some of our members have already received some. We are hopeful so hopeful that the pandemic will begin to subside with the sustained efforts as others get, get vaccinated throughout the spring. 
and I light the last candle for the community's efforts to remain connected to each other with love and chocolate and the upcoming Valentine's Day bake sale. It may seem like a small endeavor, but I recognize that it is an expression of our desire to remain in each other's lives during this time when we must remain physically separate from each other, but we long to be together, and this is a way to do so. We light these candles today because we are a single, separate people linked into community by love and need and our search for truth. What touches one of us touches all of us. We live by our shared concern, our gathered love. We are a part of the web of life that makes us one with all of humanity and one with all of the universe. We are grateful for these sacred connections that enable us to remember to love, to care, and to celebrate. Who will I be? Who will I be? What will I see? What will I see? In this great world, in this great world, who could be free? Who could be free? And what will I build? What will I build? What will I find? What will I find? My story begins. My story begins. Inside my mind. Inside my mind. Who will I be? Who will I be? And what will I see? What will I see in this great world? In this great world, who could be free? Who could be free? What will I build? What will I build? And what will I find? What will I find? My story begins. My story begins inside my mind. Inside my mind. In my imagination. Ooh, my imagination. What is an imagination? Hmm. Lucy, do you know what imagination means? Mm -mm. I think imagination is what helps people create new things all the time. Because you can't create new things if you can't imagine what you want them to be. That is absolutely true, Jacob. Everything human made was an idea first. You know, one of my favorite imaginers in history was Leonardo da Vinci. I loved that he imagined that human beings could fly hundreds of years before we figured out how to do it. And Dr. King is another great imaginer. His speeches about the dream that he had outlined a vision for how people could live better together in this country was all about having that vision first and then finding the words to communicate it and then being inspired to certain actions that would bring it closer and closer to reality. Do you like to make up stories? Uh, when you play with your magnets mm -hmm. or when you play with your babies? Mm -hmm. That's using your imagination, thinking of stories and characters who are doing things all inside your mind. It's amazing. We have movies playing in our minds all the time. And it's really important to be the director of our movies, to recognize that we can tell ourselves stories that make us feel good or stories that make us feel bad. And we get to choose which thoughts we have. We just have to practice deciding how we use our imaginations. Can you think of something that maybe doesn't exist yet or that no one has ever seen, but that can make your life better or make the world better for those of us who are sharing it. I would love to know what kind of ideas you have about how the future could be and that you're already starting to imagine and that one day all of us will see. Who will I be? Who will I be? And what will I see? And what will I see? In this
this great world, in this great world, who could be free? Who could be free? What will I build? What will I build? And what will I find? What will I find? My story begins. Story begins inside my mind. Inside my mind. In my imagination. Ooh, my imagination. Please join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. This prayer was written by Reverend Kathleen Rowlands. Spirit of love and justice, who befriends those who stand upon the constant edge of decision, crucial and alone. We are grateful to be together this morning. We gather especially to remember Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But not only him, but there were thousands of unnamed women and men who put their bodies and lives on the line so that we may all be free. And yet freedom comes at a cost. And we know that racism and homophobia, ageism and ableism, sexism and classism, all of these often unacknowledged realities prevent us from fully knowing one another from creating the beloved community spoken of by prophets and ordinary persons alike. May the work of Dr. King continue to eradicate injustice wherever and whenever we encounter it. May we continue to speak out against injustice, to speak, even if we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. May the spirit of Dr. King continue to flow through our daily living. May we have the courage of Dr. King as we continue to stand up for justice, reconciliation, and truth. Despite challenge and controversy, Dr. King went to the mountaintop. He saw the promised land and he reassured us we will get there one day. May that be no paradisal dream, but a reality in our own time. May it be so. Amen.
Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be the land where every man is free. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on people's lives, we must take back our land again. America! Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America, America will, will be. be. And now I'll share with you my reflection. When I think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I think of the civil rights movement. I think of nonviolent resistance. I think of protests. I think of marches. All of these thoughts represent passionate action and resilience. Resilience that we need right now, the domestic terrorists that attacked our capital were brandishing many obvious and sublime symbols of white supremacy that Dr. King was so passionately working to eradicate from our society and culture. Does this mean that Dr. King's work has failed and it was of no use? Absolutely not. It means we still have more work to do and that we are still in the midst of the civil rights movement today. As I think of this, thoughts of resilience come flooding into my head. The events at the Capitol seem like setbacks that may make us feel like we've been knocked down or perhaps defeated but I'm reminded of the song Resilience that our UUFC choir sang in our sanctuary a couple of years ago. It goes like this. Resilience, we are strong. Shoulder to shoulder, keep moving on. Resilience, make a new plan. Stand up again and say, yes, we can. Resilience. 
My friends, it is time for passionate action. Not just once a year to commemorate Dr. King's birthday, but all year long, passionate action. I'm not talking about the put your cape on and save the world superhero action, but more of those simple everyday actions that can make a difference and do make a difference. What that looks like for me was attending the, the kneel-in uh, that we had after the George Floyd death, organizing and supporting employee, an employee resource group for people of color at my work site, which I am in the midst of doing now, and using my white privilege to speak up when I hear non-inclusive or non-affirming language being spoken in my presence. These are all small things, but things that I can do daily. Some say it's not enough, and I agree it's not. But one of the many valuable things that I learned from attending the Clemson Area Pledge to End Racism workshop is there's always more to do, but I should not wait to do it. I need to start now doing what I can what I can do today and let that can do grow over time. So what are you doing? What are you doing today? I'm curious, I'm genuinely curious and interested in hearing from you so I can learn and gain some new ideas and insight on what I can do tomorrow and what, I can, what else I can grow into over time. So I encourage you to share those thoughts with me as you feel moved. If you haven't started yet, what are you waiting for? I'll close my reflection with a poem that I learned many, many years ago, but a poem that comes to mind every time I'm at the edge of taking action. It's called On the Plains of Hesitation. On the plains of hesitation, bleach the bones of countless millions who at the dawn of their victory sat and waited and in their waiting died. So my friends, let's go forth in passionate action together. Civil rights activist James Weldon Johnson wrote Lift Their Voice and Sing as a poem, which was set to music by his brother John Roseman Johnson in 1899. The song is now known as the Black National Anthem in America. It is a protest, a hymn, and a prayer of profound significance for our people. We lift every voice and sing to express ourselves. We lift every voice to show that we have strength in numbers and we will not be silent. We lift every voice and sing to be lifted, liberated, and free. Freedom, the power to determine action without restraint. Freedom, the absence of or release from ties, obligations, or restrictions. Freedom, the ease or facility of movement or action. Freedom, frankness or boldness in manner or speech. Freedom, a political right. Until we are all free, none of us is free. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Lift every voice and sing.
Tomorrow, our nation will once again honor the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This annual holiday raises up a man, a black man, as the symbol of nonviolence and racial justice. Little children learn about him in school, having heard, at least in part, his famous I Have a Dream speech. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, won hundreds of other awards, earned a PhD and was the face of the fight for racial equality and justice until his death in 1968. King should rightly be honored. Yet King himself said in a sermon that he gave two months before his assassination that he did not want to be honored for these things. He wanted to be remembered as someone who dedicated his life to serving others. At the time he shared this, King was in Memphis, fighting for poor people, for trash haulers. 
he had turned his attention against the Vietnam War and began working to improve the lives of poor people in addition to championing racial justice. King and many others called for a revolution of values in America, and they sought to build a broad, inclusive movement that could unite the poor and impact communities across the country. Their name was a direct cry from the underside of history, the Poor People's Campaign. In 1966, King was invited to give the Ware Lecture at the General Assembly of the UUA, and the lecture was titled, in such a great title, Don't Sleep Through the Revolution. His directives to, this, to us then as Unitarian Universalists still ring clear today. King noted that one of the great misfortunes of history is that all too many individuals and institutions find themselves in a great period of change and yet fail to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the situation demands. There is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. That was in 1966 and King then asked to those gathered the great question is what do we do when we find ourselves in such a period of revolution? King said that the church had a great responsibility because when the church is true to its nature, it stands as the moral guardian of the community and of society. It has always been the role of the church to broaden horizons, to challenge the status quo and to question and break mores if necessary. This was true in 1966, and it, it is also true in 2021. King outlined four points for the gathered you use to consider as a call to action. First, he reminded them that they were all interconnected. He gave examples of this and said that all in the world are neighbors. He said, we will all perish together as fools if we do not live as neighbors. This is a fact of life, he said. No individual can live alone, no nation can live alone. As our UU principles declare, we affirm our interconnectedness and our belief in the world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all as stated by our UU principles. Secondly, King appealed to us that it was necessary for the church to affirm over and over again the essential immorality of racism. T King declared that any church that did not actively work to address racism was sleeping through the revolution. To remain awake is to refute the idea that there are superior and inferior races, he said. It is out of this notion that the whole doctrine of white supremacy came into being and that the church must take a stand through religious education and other channels to direct the popular mind at this point. For there are some strange people who believe in this strange doctrine, close quote. Well, we know in 2021 that this strange doctrine of white supremacy is alive and strong in the U.S. This was especially clear after the terrorism occurred at the Capitol on January 6th and of the murmurs of actions being planned for the day of the presidential inauguration coming up on January 20th. Then and now, we are morally called to do all we can to dismantle white supremacy. Our current work as you use to address white supremacy head on in our history, in our present society, in our congregations and with each other is paramount to continuing what King implored us to do 53 years ago. 
The third point King declared was that the next thing the church must do is to remain awake through this revolution and to move out into the arena of social action. He said it is not enough for the church to work in the ideological realm and to clear up misguided ideas. To remain awake through this social revolution, the church must engage in strong action programs to get rid of the last vestiges of segregation and discrimination, such as inequality in housing, schools, and unemployment. He reminded us then that it may be true that morality can be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. It may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. The law cannot make a man love me, he said, but it can restrain him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important also. And so while the law may not change the hearts of men, it does change the habits of men. So it is necessary for the church to support strong, meaningful civil rights legislation. The fourth and final point of his argument was to remain vigilant despite the achievements of the day. He said we must deal with, what we must deal with is that of exaggerated progress. King reflected of the progress made at the time with legislation. As he described, we must realize the plant of freedom is only a bud and not yet a flower. King noted that although progress had been made up to 1966, he said, I am appalled that some people feel that the civil rights struggle is over because we had a 1964 civil rights bill with 10 titles and a voting rights bill. Over and over again, people ask, what else do you want? They feel that everything is all right. Close quote. I summarize that his argument overall was that the church itself was to support continued legislation to bring about justice and to do the change that was necessary to change the human heart. In our time now, to do this, we need to address the structures of racism present and the criminalization of being a person of color simply by living. I believe if King were alive today, he would implore us as religious people to maintain a focus on the equity of voting rights and education and housing, along with the understanding of the inherent racism in our nation's prison system. He described how schools were inadequate, cities were still segregated, school dropout rates and rates of unemployment for people of color were staggering. His description still applies today. He closed his talk with a call of action. He said, I talk a great deal about the need for a kind of divine discontent. And I always mention that there are certain technical words within every science, which become stereotypes and cliches. Modern psychology has a word that has become com common. It is the word maladjusted. It is a ringing cry of modern child psychology and certainly we all want to live as well-adjusted personalities. But I must say to you this evening, my friends, there are some things in our nation and in our world to which I am proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon you to be maladjusted to all people of goodwill, to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the people to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of people perishing on a lonely island of poverty 
in the midst of a vast ocean of prosperity. I must honestly say, however much criticism it brings, that I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and to the self-defeating effects of physical violence. It is no longer a choice between non-violence and violence. It is now a choice between non-violence and non-existence. He continues, I have not despaired of the future. I believe firmly that we can solve this problem. I know that there are still difficult days ahead, and there are days of glorious opportunity. Our goal for America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's. Before the Pilgrim Fathers landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before Jefferson etched across the pages of history the words of the Declaration of Independence, we were here. Before the beautiful words of the Star-Spangled Banner were written, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebears labored here without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters in the midst of the most oppressive and humiliating conditions, and yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continued to grow and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition that we now face will surely fail. We're going to win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of the Almighty God are embodied in our echoing demands. And we can sing, we shall overcome, because somehow we know the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We shall overcome because Carlisle is right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth will be crushed, will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell Loyal is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown. Standeth God within the shadow Keep we can watch above his own. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood and speed up that day when all God's children all over the nation and the world will be able to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. And then we can sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you. As his Ware lecture came to an end, in 1966, I can say now that we can need to continue to heed King's call to us. This work is just as important now as it was then. On the 50th anniversary of King's assassination in 2018 on April 4th, Reverend William Barber stood on the patio where Martin Luther King was killed. He revived the Poor People's Campaign as an intentional extension of King's work. This new campaign, a national call for moral revival, has picked up this unfinished work. The campaign describes this movement as from Alaska to Arkansas, from the Bronx to the border, People are coming together to confront the interlocking evils of systemic racism, poverty, 
ecological devastation, militarism and the war economy, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. Barber says, we understand that as a nation, we are at a critical juncture, that we need a movement that will shift the moral narrative, impact the policies and elections at every level of government, and build a lasting power for poor and impacted people. A revolution of values. Since then, waves of nonviolent civil disobedience, rallies and protests were orga organized within this campaign in over 40 states. A renewed movement is emerging and these campaigns are demonstrating the power of poor people to be agents of change in the very heart of democracy. Their efforts are focusing on change and are changing the moral narrative of understanding and ending the interlocking injustices of social racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, militarism, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. They seek to challenge the lie of scarcity in the midst of abundance. And last, this campaign seeks to lift the voices of the, and faces of poor and low-income Americans and their moral allies with a new vision of love, justice, and truth for America that says poverty can be abolished and change can come. In honor of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in 2021, I will personally work to continue the efforts of the Poor People's Campaign. I am called as a Unitarian Universalist and as a religious leader to do this work. And as King calls me to do as a religious person, I am to stay awake during the revolution, to work to change what is in the human heart, and to support the goals of the Poor People's Campaign as it was then and as it is now. So today, I dedicate these efforts to the memory and to the life of King. Join me, dear ones, for this is holy work. We come to the end of our worship together this morning, but may it begin the week of ministry towards love and justice for this world. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment, 
These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Amen.